So blinking sods law here is, oh, we tied a nymph and hair pressed all against, I suppose the rub of the green in terms of conditions, there's a couple of fish. And just keeping low, we are dealing with wild fish here and also it's very bright and extremely clear water so just watching the surface. Oh, he's just eaten a dun. That fish there just took a, a, a large dark olive. So that's given me an indication where he's at. And I'll just make my way out. My style of fishing on these low clear waters, I just don't rush the situation. It's nice and slow. Prepare myself before I get anywhere near the fish. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make is They'll come up onto a fish and then proceed to extend line using several false casts. I like to be ready before I uh, get up to the fish, so we'll just prepare a little bit of line now, have that ready. And I can sort of roll that up and be on the fish quite sharpish. It's just slow for me, there's no rush. This fish, remember it's a river, so the river's acting like a conveyor belt bringing food to the fish, so generally speaking they remain in the same position. Sometimes they traverse a wee bit, but fully expect this, it's mid-river in the main floor. Fully expect it to remain on station. Obviously, if you've got <clears throat> a lot of fly coming down, the fish will be rising more regular, so you can pinpoint him very accurately. However, haven't got that luxury today. They're just a, it's just not quite enough fly coming down. There's a fish shown over there on the far bank as well. That's not our target. And here's a dun coming down. So all I do, I wait and watch. I can see a fly coming down. See if this fish eats it perhaps a wee bit far over. That looks like a March Brown as well, just off the size. Uh, it's just been eaten. So that's encouraging. There is a fish closer to me. It's, you're always in a dilemma now. Do you go for the one you've just seen rise or do you gradually work towards it with some casts in the general area where you marked the closer fish which would be my tendency. Ruffle surface with this upstream breeze which perhaps gives us an opportunity to throw a caster to him without too much disturbance because the surface is ruffled so I might just do that here. See that lift straight up into the cast and there flies out there. Just drifting over the general area. Tracking the flight. Using quite a longish leader, the idea being again the conditions determine that we uh, we want the fly to land appreciable a distance away. I'll throw a false cast or two. Not quite as far this time. It's somewhere around there, hopefully. I'll throw this first false cast downstream there to get the um, residual water off it. I don't want to throw a false cast over the fish. Perhaps doesn't matter too much here. Some nice drifts there. Fly's not dragging, it's quite a uniform flow on this part of the river as you can see. I haven't seen a fly drift down for a while either now. 
certainly no more risers. Oh, and then we just missed one. And that, Mr. Proctor, what happens when you're talking to the camera sometimes, but that's encouraging. So, we have seen a rise up here, just in the form lane, and it's just risen again there. A little bit of a tricky situation, it's tempting to cast from this tree stump over here, but you're going over so many current lanes, we've got to be mindful of where the trees are as well. And just keeping low is not what I'd term really regular, but we'll have a look. Uh, again, just checking the trees. He's eating there, he's just eating a dun. So I remember earlier we were talking about the streamy water, just have you give them working line out. This is a classic situation. See my line downstream in my right hand. If you've got a lot of line out, that's just being washed away all the time. I'd ideally like to be a bit further over on this fish to cut this immediate current out you know, upstream of me. You see duns on the surface, just need him to show on out. There he is. one more time. Oh there he is. He's moving about a wee bit. Just risen again. Dun's on the surface here. Paul that was a bad cast. I said earlier, if you put a bad cast in, just let that drift out of the way. It's in quite a precise current lane here. He's not eating every dun either, which makes it a little bit more tricky. You often think in these situations, what chance has he got of picking my fly off? And <laughs> worse still, he's moving about. There he is. Again, just get that fish on a short rein. Missed him there, it's in this fast water. Oh, let's go back. There we go. There we go, nice trout. So everyone, <laughs> quite a hard one wild brown trout there probably against a rubber player given the conditions but ultimately I hope it's all made sense from the insects we looked at, the fly tying and then putting um, that theory into practice and these are the rewards. Uh, like I say, just a gorgeous creature, gorgeous creature. So ladies and gentlemen what we've got here, this is really nice, quite excited to share this with you but what we've got here is in the foreground is the March Brown and this little diamond or beauty on here is a, a large dark olive. You can see the significant size difference but sometimes when you're uh, doing live shows you're restricted to a given date and uh, you, you, you don't actually get time or the opportunity to, to, to share this with people but the fact is 
the nymphs we were looking at this morning, the um, agile darters, this is the winged adult we're looking at here, and this is the winged adult of the March Brown. So that, that's fantastic, it really is. I'm delighted uh, it's come together. And there, there goes the large dark fluttered off. So we're left with the March Brown. Well, Paul, it's been a great day. Thank you so much for inviting me to this gorgeous part of the world. You said when we first set out onto the river that you looked at the sky, there were no clouds, and you thought, oh, it's going to be tough, but we found a rising fish. Yeah, well, yeah, we found a couple. Of, as you know, I messed one up just to show that, you know, that does happen, trust me, folks. Um, I think I talked those up by tying that nymph, Johnny. You could guarantee if I'd have tied a dry fly, we wouldn't have seen a fish rise yeah, over there. Yeah. But because I hung it on the nymph, we've caught all these nymphs, blah, 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 oh, and we need to use this, and suddenly we come round the corner and we were blessed with some rising fish. Yeah. So, so that, yeah, yeah, that was really good. A little bit of relief, if I'm honest. As you know, I, I do like my dry fly fishing, and today, a little bit of patience and stealth paired off, and it put us amongst a couple of fish. So yeah. that, Absolutely. Yeah, really enjoyable. Just Thank a, you. a stunning specimen of a, a wild English brownie. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about tackle, Paul, because we didn't uh, earlier in the film. We were just trying to get out and get that fish. And we got That's a window, a, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, I know you've been instrumental in, in designing some trout gear for the Mackenzie range, and that's what you've been fishing with today. So what can you tell me about that particular rod and yeah, why, well, you my, my, it, why you like to use it? Absolutely. I mean, as you, as you rightly said, but quite an influence in the NX1 range along with Scott. And this is a 10 foot four weight. Uh, it's my go to. We do, as, as you'd expect, a good range of rods. Um, it's why I like a 10 foot rod, because you've just got that extra length that facilitates line mending, be these aerial mends or little micro mends on the water surface, curve cast. Four way, it, it, it's a bit of a compromise. You've still got that delicacy for days like this yeah. and slightly finer tippets. Uh, however, you know, there's a wee bit of oomph there when you, when you run into those fish that are that little bit more special. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I carry two, as you've noticed, you, you were asking earlier, this is a eight foot six four weight, um, obviously, so it corresponds with the four weight line. Yep. Uh, the reason it's shorter is if I run into really heavy tree cover, I've got, I've got that, but uh, it also acts as a backup rod because uh, as you've seen today, we, we can walk a fair way. Yeah, and we've covered a good <laughs> distance. We do not want to be two or three miles away from the car in a blizzard of a hatch and, and we have an accident with the rod, do we? Yeah, you yeah. Know? always a good, a good thing to carry with you. But uh, well, no, it's been, a, it's been an amazing day, Paul. I've loved it. It's been a hell of a lot of exercise, <laughs> um, but it's been fantastic to see you in your element and, and see a beautiful wild brownie like that in the net. So thank you so much for, for sharing it with me. No, thank you. And I hope you folks at Sportsfish enjoy this and enjoy your weekend, everybody.